Well, good afternoon. I'm Beth Stewart, Director of the Texas Oral Health Coalition. And on behalf of the coalition, welcome you to today's special webinar provided by the UT Health San Antonio School of Dentistry. The Texas Recruits and Retrains program is a HRSA funded grant that partners three dental schools in Texas whose objectives include training and enhancing the dental public health workforce and research opportunities aimed at improving access to care. We are pleased to host today's speakers to discuss poverty and oral health, two research perspectives on reducing health inequities. Today's facilitator is Magda De La Torre, who serves as clinical assistant professor in the Department of Comprehensive Dentistry Division of Dental Public Health at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio School of Dentistry. Ms. De La Torre received her Bachelor of Science in Dental Hygiene from UT Health and a Master of Public Health from Texas A&M University with a concentration in health policy and management and behavioral health. A dental professional for 35 years, she has dedicated 18 years to academia. Ms. De La Torre was a recipient of the 2008 UT Health Presidential Teaching Excellence Award and the 2007 Spectrum Award for Excellence and Leadership in Teaching, Research, and Service in the School of Health Professions. She was also inducted into the Academy of Master Teachers and named one of Latina Style Magazine's Brilliant Latinos in Healthcare. Previously, Ms. De La Torre worked at the National Center for Farmworker Health. Center for Health Policy Development, Inc., and the State of Colorado Farm Worker Health Program. She has vast experience in implementing culturally competent components of health programs while working with national, state, and local programs and organizations. Ms. De La Torre has served on the Hispanic Dental Association Board of Directors and as Section and Governing Council for the Oral Health Section of the American Association of Public Health. She has authored numerous journal articles and textbook chapters. Currently, she teaches pre-doctoral dental students and postdoctoral residents. I'm pleased to now introduce Magna De La Torre to announce her presenters for today's webinar. Thank you, Beth. Good morning, everyone. This is Magda. What I've decided to do is I think I'm going to do my presentation and then I will introduce each speaker before they do their presentation to highlight uh, what they have contributed thus far in their careers to, uh, to dental public health. So this is our disclaimer. You know, it is for educational purposes as listed. So we do have some objectives for you and we wanna talk, we're gonna describe and talk about poverty and then understand its impact as far as the integral component is, that it links it to social determinants of health we're going to identify the correlation between income, education, and population size in relation to the availability of dental products. And then we're also going to understand the importance of cultural competency training among future healthcare providers through analyzing a, a social determinants of health based interprofessional experiential learning model. So we hear the word poverty so much in and, and we all have our different perspectives. We've all experienced uh, different uh, activities and, and um, events in our lives that have, have demonstrated poverty to us, whether it's the people we work with, whether it's the neighborhood we, we uh, work in or we've lived in and, or our patients themselves. But you know, it's really looking at more than the lack of the income and productive resources to ensure that, that sustainable livelihood. We're also looking at manifestations that include hunger, malnutrition, limited access to education, and other basic services that we think about in daily quality of life. There is also social discrimination and exclusion that we must not be in denial about that exists and that puts people in poverty. The lack of participation in decision making is that inability of having choices and opportunities. And so it's a violation of human dignity and the inabilities of survival with dignity is what we are referring to when, when we're talking about poverty. 
And there are two types of poverty. We've got absolute and relative poverty. So absolute poverty is that complete lack of means necessary to meet your basic personal needs, such as food, clothing, and shelter. And this is always the same independent of the person's permanent, uh, permanent location or era. So it doesn't matter where somebody is living or what time, they're, what era they're living in. Relative poverty is more when a person cannot meet a minimum level of living standards compared to others at the same time and place. And this does then vary from one country to another, from regions within one country to another, and from one society to another. So I wanted to share a little bit about world regions of total wealth and kind of look at where we stand when we're looking at trillions of US dollars. And you can see that North America is the wealthiest depicted in this slide. We've got Europe next, Asia Pacific, China, Latin America, India, and Africa. So when we think about North America being the wealthiest in this geographic slide, then to look at poverty in the United States really makes us take a step back to think that in 2018, there was 38.1 million people that were living in poverty in our country. And there is nearly one of every eight individuals one of every eight Americans live in poverty. So poverty does rate um, for all people mass considerable va variations between racial and ethnic subgroups. Poverty rates amongst black and Hispanic people greatly exceeds the national average. Poverty projections rates for 2020 will be 9.2%. So white non-Hispanic is at 6.6. Black, non-Hispanic, 15.2, and Hispanic, 13.7. So the, and also the poverty rates are highest for families headed by single women. Projection of poverty, the official data on poverty rates for 2020 will not be available until September, 2021. So we are looking at data that is projected, you know, continuing and emerging hardships that we see that are facing US families as a result of the current economic and public health crisis that we face right now is also something to, to take into consideration. And in that reference, I'm you know, referring to of course, COVID-19 and our pandemic. And in 2020, there was an annual poverty rate that was um, that could be much greater if we had not had the COVID-19 pandemic response policy. This is information or data from June of this year. And what we're looking at is that the projected poverty rate with pandemic response policy is 9.2%. If we had not had the response rate for COVID-19, we would have been at 12.4. That means that the number of people kept out of poverty by the pandemic response policies is in the millions, 10.3 million people have been kept out of poverty. And that's because of this public health uh, pandemic that we are facing and crisis that we are facing in our country now. So things could definitely be much worse than where we're at. There are a multitude of different social, economic, and cultural factors that determine a person's health. So poverty and poor health worldwide are instinctively linked together. They are linked and our poverty level affects our health. Poor nutrition, overcrowding, lack of clean water, or other harsh realities put people's health at risk. Poverty is the single largest determinant of health and ill health is an obstacle to social and economic development. Poor people live shorter lives and have poorer health than affluent people. This disparity has drawn attention to the remarkable sensitivity of health to the social environment. We also know that poverty limits access to healthy foods and safe neighborhoods, and that more education is a predictor of better health. Differences in health are striking in communities with poor social determinants of health, such as unstable housing, low income, unsafe neighborhoods, or substandard education. In addition, by applying what we know about social determinants of health, we can not only improve individual and population health, but
but also advance health equity. I wanted to point out a um, frontline episode on PBS that talks about growing up poor in America. This was aired in September of this year. It's, it's a current edition of Frontline. And what it does is it follows three young people, young children in Ohio and their lives in poverty and their perspective of where they see their future going and how they see their lives. And so I would highly encourage you to um, go on the PBS website and watch this uh, video, Frontline video, Growing Up Poor in America. So going back to our social determinants of health, you know, in healthy people, we see that economic stability is definitely a determinant of health. There's others we looked at, education, healthcare, social and community context, neighborhood and built environment. But I wanna focus right now on our economic stability. And many times we think of only, like I said, financial situations. But even under that, when you look at economic stability, this is one of my favorite slides or charts from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And it really breaks it down into sub levels of under economic stability. We're talking about employment, income, expenses, debt, medical bills, and any support. Under neighborhood and physical environment, we're looking at housing, transportation, safety, parks, playgrounds, walkability in that neighborhood. In education, it's not just what education they have. Um, literally, it's when you're looking at literacy, language, early childhood education, vocational training, and the ability to obtain a higher education. Also under food, we've got hunger and the access to healthy options. The community and social context, we are looking at social integration, support systems, community engagement and discrimination. And then we've got our healthcare system as well. And what we're looking at that is do individuals have health coverage? And sometimes it's not just do they have health coverage, but do they have adequate health coverage? Are there provider availabilities, you know, linguistic and culturally appropriate providers and the quality of care in general? All of these then impact the health outcomes and someone's mobility, mortality, life expectancy, our health status, our functional limitations and our healthcare expenditures. So when we look at all of those, they then impact the risk of oral diseases, managing all your oral diseases. How is oral health related to the quality of life? Because we know that it is also an oral systemic health connection. So looking at all of this and what we look at sometimes poverty, I want us to make sure that we're looking at all of the realms that it extends to. So that is my portion. What I would like to do next in, is introduce our next speaker, and that is Jessica Elvia de la Fuente. And Jessica is a third year dental student at um, UT Health Science Center in San Antonio. And um, she graduated with a biology degree from Baylor University with a summa cum laude. And Jessica is also very involved in various organizations. She is a leader in her community and among her students. She's been involved in IP course development or interprofessional course developments. She also has conducted the research that she will be presenting today. And um, this research study was selected to be presented at the International Association of Dental Research, IADR at the UT Health Science Symposium, and recently at the 2020 Open National Meeting where she received first place in her poster. In addition to uh, research, she also hold, holds leadership, leadership positions with the American Student Dental Association. She is involved with teaching honors program where she has is a tutor for gross anatomy, dental anatomy, operative and fixed um, prosthodontics. And in her spare time, she enjoys spending time with her significant other and her family. Her goals are to provide quality dental care to the underserved communities in her hometown of Brownsville in the future. Jessica. Thank you, Professor La Torre, for your warm welcome. And thank you everyone for being here today and joining us this afternoon. 
So my name is Jessica de la Fuente and together with Professor Magda de la Torre, we conducted this research titled Determinants of Oral Health, Dental Products Availability by Geographic Areas. So the, and this oral health project was conducted to determine the availability of dental products and access to care in different zip codes throughout San Antonio, Texas. This comparative study sought to reveal if poverty, income levels, and educational levels within each zip code have a significant impact in the types of dental products sold and the amount of shelf space given to these products in certain grocery stores. So in essence, this project also analyzed the social determinants of health, including the factors that measure social and economic variables, as well as socioeconomic status and educational levels. Now zip code selection. So using an online random generator, 20 zip codes and their respective HEB stores were selected and outlined on the map to ensure an even geographic distribution in order to compare the availability of various dental products. So we decided to um, maintain uniformity throughout the project. So we selected one main grocery store to collect all our data from, and we chose the HEB store. Now HEB, um, for those that don't know, was recently named number one, the number one grocery store in the nation by the Dunhumby company, as well as the Food and Wide um, company as well. So um, HEB has more than 340 stores in Texas and Northeast Mexico, and it's quickly expanding. And not only that, but also the headquarters of HEB, the HEB company are located here in San Antonio. So it's really relevant. It's a really relevant store here in the city and throughout Texas as well. So if you look at the image here, there's a map of San Antonio with all the zip codes located in this city. Now the zip codes outlined with white circles are areas that we want to collect the data from. So in, at each zip code, we chose one HEB store to see how many dental products were being sold at that store. Now, the zip codes with the black stars indicate regions that did not have HEB stores in those, those locations. So as you can see on the map, the black stars are really um, localized to the periphery of the map, to the periphery of the city of San Antonio. So unfortunately, unfortunately we could not collect data from those regions. Now, shell space and ANCAP. So here are some images of the uh, usual aisles where they sell dental products at HEB stores. I wanted to introduce the concept of ANCAS because they're really important not only in marketing, um, but also in what uh, you know customers buy when they go to HEB stores. Now the ANCAPs are at the end of the aisles and those are usually what we see at the stores when we're walking by um, through the different aisles. Um, and ANCAPs are a way to market um, certain items at the store so customers can um, buy them more readily. And the fact that uh, dental products are being sold at this end caps um, may be a good sign because that means they're advocating for a dental product, um, selling dental products in general. Now at each store, photos were captured of the total number of dental products sold at each HEB store, as well as the shelf space. So the feed, um, the amount of feed and shelf space were counted with a measuring ruler. And we counted the different products ranging from toothbrushes to toothpaste, also mouth guard products, denture products, everything. And we subdivided them and saw how many different products were sold at each of the different grocery stores. And now here were the results. So I'm going to be showing a series of graphs in the um, upcoming slides. And this graph in particular shows the average adjusted gross income per zip code. Now here in the graph, I align the different zip code regions from the highest um, income levels to the lowest income level regions. So as you can see here on this graph, zip code 7257 had an average adjusted gross income of around $235,000. Now, if we look here at the far right, zip code 78207 had the lowest um, adjusted gross income in that region with an average income of around $25,000. So as you can see, the difference was quite drastic and in those comparing those two regions. Now this next graph shows the shell space in feet per zip code. Now zip code, and they're arranged in the same order. So they're arranged from the highest income to the lowest income regions. Now zip code 7257 had um, an average shelf space of more than 300 feet, so around 320 feet. Uh, whereas zip code 78207, which had the lowest income regions, their um, shelf space was about 164 feet. 
So it was quite a difference in that too. And while there wasn't a uniform trend comparing all the different zip codes in between, we can notice that there was a significant difference between the region with the highest income levels and the region with the lowest income levels. Now, I want to point an outlier here, zip code 7204 here in the middle. So their shelf space uh, of dental products sold in that HEB was only 22 feet. And the reason that was is because it wasn't a regular HEB store. So it was actually a market store. And um, it's a different kind of HEB store in that sense because it's more like a convenience store. It's located next to a hotel. It's more like for tourists to buy um, you know, quick uh, supplies that they need while they're on their trip. So that's the outlier. Now here's a graph showing the population per zip code. And again, the zip codes are arranged in the same order from right to left. So zip code 78257 that had the highest income and had a really high, uh, relatively high shelf space available. It also had one of the lowest populations in that region. Now compared to zip code 78207, which was one of the lowest income regions and they had a pretty low um, shelf space available for dental products. Now they have one of the highest populations in that zip code. So in essence, what these results are telling us is that um, in zip code 78207, there's a, there's a low income neighborhood with um, not as many dental products sold in that respective HEB store. And there's a lot of more people in that region. So that means there's fewer resources available for a larger population. We also analyzed the education and school test performance in each zip code region. And again, they're um, arranged in the same order, right to left. And as you can see, the more affluent of zip code regions performed better in their school test performance. They were excellent or above average. And then we see at the far right, uh, the zip codes that were less affluent, less affluent, you know, with less income, they performed below average in their school test performance as well. So you can see this relative downward trend in this graph. And these are the same results, just arranged in a different way. So I decided to list, list them instead of showing them on a graph. So as you can see here, the um, zip code that had the greatest shelf space available for dental products was zip code 78253. And their overall shelf space was around 404.5 feet. And if you look at the right column, while zip code 78253 didn't have the highest adjusted gross income, they did have a relatively high income compared to the other regions that are ranked number three. Now, as you can see here, 78207 um, at the lower uh, left side, they had 164 feet available for shelf space for dental products. And if you see over here on the right side, you, you can see that they had the lowest income as well, close to 200, I mean $25,000 versus their, their average income. And again, the, reiterating the population, um, zip code 78253 had a population of around 29,000 people, but zip code 78207 had a population of about 55,000 people. So again, there's a larger population with fewer resources available to them. Now, zip code comparison. So I decided to have, get the um, zip code with the highest income and the zip code with the lowest income, uh, gross income, and compare them side to side. So again, zip code 78257 had an average adjusted gross income of around $235,000, while zip code 78207 had an average adjusted gross income of around $25,000. If we compare the shell space, um, zip code 78257 had 296 feet, and the other one had 164 feet. So that's more than 100 feet difference between the two stores. And if you compare the different products like toothbrushes and toothpastes, the options are also more limited at the less affluent um, zip code. And while there's still a, a good amount of options available, you can see how there's a difference between both regions. Not only that, but also in the electric toothbrushes sold. So surprisingly, zip code 78207 did not sell any toothbrushes at all. And um, also in other, not in this zip code, since they didn't sell any electric toothbrushes, but in other zip codes that were in the lower income levels, the, the electric toothbrushes were behind glass doors. So there were less than, and they were locked behind glass doors versus in the other ATB stores that were more affluent that you could just readily get them um, whenever you wanted. So overall conclusions and future recommendations. So the purpose of this project was basically to, to conduct the first core function of public health, which was assessment. So we collected the data and analyzed the data. 
And we hope that this project in the future will help assure policy development and assurance so that we can help reduce health disparities in these regions as well. So overall, our results show that the availability of dental products varied among the different zip codes. Um, also, we analyzed the socioeconomic status, educational levels, and population. You can see a distinct di difference between the different zip codes. And we hope that in the future, we can expand on this project and further um, analyze the health status, insurance, employment, and housing characteristics so we can see how we can better help those regions that, that need help that are, are less affluent, that have less dental products available. And hopefully we can send outreach programs to those regions and help them as, as best as we can. And this was my project and we'll answer any questions at the end of, of the whole presentation. So thank you for your time. All right, I would like to then present our next speaker. Dr. El Wasir is a pediatric dentist from Egypt. She completed a three year pediatric residency with a master's degree in pediatric uh, dentistry in her, own, in her country before moving to the United States. She gained uh, her master's of public health degree from Purdue University. And then in 2000, June of 2000, she completed her dental public health residency at UT Health San Antonio. She has dedicated more than 10 years to advance the population health uh, on both academic as far as clinical research and service levels. And Dr. Elwazir was recently selected as an awardee of the Stephen J. Leadership Public Health Award. On the research level, she has recently was recently honored with the Anthony Westward, Westwater John Memorial Population Oral Health Award. And she is serving as co-chair of the scientific program planning and oral health section of the American Public Health Association. She's also a current member of the Council on Education uh, Affairs of the American Association of Public Health Dentistry. Dr. Elwazir is transitioning now from her role as obtaining more knowledge and gaining after completing her residency. And I'm sure that any organization or agency that can manage to talk her into going to work with them will definitely be an asset. Dr. Elwazir. Thank you. Thank you, Professor De La Torre, And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. So I am um, like building on uh, what Jessica was just talking about, like this inequities and this hidden barriers and ask a question. So do dental providers understand actually those hidden barriers? And when we actually dig in the literature to see, we found an evidence actually that many dentists and oral health providers don't understand the realities from where those low income population come from and even tend to stigmatize low income individuals based on certain biases and stereotypes toward them. The Commission of Dental Accreditation, the CODA, stood up for that and emphasized the need on, of the incorporating more social determinants of health opportunities on the didactic and field level for our future generations of all our oral health work providers. Building on that and supporting that, the National Academy of Medicine and the Advisory Committee on Training in Primary Care Medicine and, Den and Dentistry by HRSA emphasized the need for more cultural competency training, especially with an interprofessional educational model, an aspect that again is emphasized by the Commission of Dental Accreditation. We at UT Health San Antonio try to put these pieces together, try to enhance the healthcare curricula at our health institution to uh, build more cultural competency oriented curricula and foster an interprofessional education model in combination with these social determinants of health based opportunities. Our platform for this, and this is particular study, was poverty simulation. So, what's poverty simulation? Poverty simulation is a tool and an experiential approach that was introduced by the Missouri Community Action Network, where participants can come and role play the lives, the actual lives of low-income families and 
simulate the challenges, the very hard challenges faced by those individuals um, and see how they can manage that. So the simulation activity consists of for 15 minutes consecutive sessions through which the participants face various challenges on the financial time and emotional level in order to be able at the end to help understand the realities of poverty. So this actual approach has been used in various healthcare specialities especially the nursing and pharmacy, and have been introduced actually as well with dental students. But our approach stands for the evaluation of the outcome of them, which is an area of scarcity among dental professionals, future dental professionals. And also, we are trying to foster some sort of interprofessional communication between future dentists and other healthcare specialists within the UT Health San Antonio and this cultural competency training for our students. So, the aim and objective is to use this experiential learning model, the poverty simulation approach, interprofessionally between the speciality of dentistry, future dental students, physician assistant studies, and the respiratory therapist. And as I mentioned, we were looking at the evaluation component regarding the level of understanding of poverty, building positive attitudes towards poverty and the confidence level in providing health care to patients experiencing poverty and the readiness for those future health care providers for interprofessional communication and collaboration. And this was by launching three longitudinal surveys before the participation in the poverty simulation, immediately after participation, and six weeks after that to see how it went, especially that we used this six weeks period in emphasizing the social determinants of health component through their didactic courses. And we have the students participated in at least one community-based clinical experience targeting low-income population. For the understanding of poverty, attitudes towards poverty, and readiness for interprofessional learning, we used validated survey instruments that are well documented from the research perspective to, to measure this longitudinal change through time. And here I'd like to emphasize the confidence scale. The confidence scale is not used before, was not used before with poverty simulation. And actually, we were trying to see that, to measure how confident are the students at the end to um, providing health care to those uh, low-income individuals. When we are looking to poverty simulation through this experiential learning model, we were thinking that we would like to enhance the student's level of knowledge and uh, understanding of the social determinants of health. We are putting them in an environmental uh, condition, circumstances, provide some sort of interaction and allow them to experience the situation in the presence of their social norms and their perception and so, and to develop that and translate it to actual behavior at the end, to develop some skills and this level of confidence. And this is actually in the foundation of like the social learning theory, one of the very uh, um, well-known theoretical foundation for any public health intervention. We are having strong interaction between the cognitive variables that we are talking about, the environmental variables, and all that will be translated at their end behavior, which is determined by their level of confidence and self-efficacy. And that's why we would like to enhance and include this in our measuring and assessment of this educational model. So we would like to see how the levels of uh, students' understandings, attitudes, confidence, and readiness for interprofessional uh, learning change over time through participation of this uh, poverty simulation experience that was conducted in an interprofessional approach, and whether these are changed by different specialities. Do dental students differ from other specialities? 
extent we were taking into consideration the different backgrounds from where the students came, different ages, gender, race and ethnicity, and level of community engagement. And those aspects were actually were captured through our surveys and were adjusted for in our analysis model, the linear method model that we used for our analysis. To actually participate, uh, to actually conduct this uh, experiential uh, learning uh, opportunity, we needed volunteers and we needed the students. So the students will be interacting with um, different agencies while we're having their daily lives. They will be having like banks, grocery stores, like schools, faith-based agencies. And so this is normal life that they are simulating. So we need volunteers to run those agencies. That's why we recruited volunteers. Our volunteers came from like faculty members who are interested in embracing this culture actually among our healthcare future generation, staff, doctoral students, uh, postdoc students, like various backgrounds, not only from UT Health, but also from other institutional agencies uh, in the area. And for the students, although the poverty simulation were included into their curriculum, we needed them to participate in the survey for the evaluation component. And this was voluntarily participation. We tried to provide an information sheet for the students in order to familiarize them with the experience and encourage them to participate in that. And we provided an incentive, with it, which was a UT Health branded water bottle, maybe to increase our response rate in order to be aware what we are going from. We need to do this evaluation and see whether it's successful or not. And this was the day of the poverty simulation interprofessionally. Here we can see the students were divided into families. The family uh, having like dental students, physician assistants, and respiratory care. This is some sort of communication together between different specialties, different perspectives, how we can face and survive uh, these harsh conditions. And here we can see the long lines with the grocery stores run by the volunteer. And like here with the employers and like the, the bank to get things and uh, the different situations that we were in and the students should play. So our results, what we got from that? Actually, we got a very high response rate, which was great for the validity and the credibility of our results. The response rate for the three surveys was around 80% and even more than that for some of our surveys. Uh, description of our sample and our students, the majority were female and were from the younger age groups and more than 50% of them were from racial and ethnic groups, from Black, Hispanics and Asians. Um, the, the, the students were 63% uh, from them were from the dental field and 37% were from the allied healthcare field and around 80% reported that they were participating regularly in community activities, which were defined in the survey actually, um, that um, they have at least two times participation in some sort of community volunteer and community action uh, every year. And the surveys were completely anonymous, so that was great to get like better responses from the students, which was actually adding as well to the credibility of our results. From the analytical point of view, we got a statistically significant improvement in these students' levels of understanding of poverty, immediately post stimulation, and also in the confidence level. And these improvements were maintained after six weeks of participation uh, in, uh, in, in this uh, simulation experience. For the attitudes uh, towards poverty and ripple uh, or the readiness for interprofessional learning, we were uh, getting insignificant changes. Um, for the attitudes for, towards poverty, a lot was insignificant, but the mean level, uh, the mean level of the attitudes level was 
higher than what was recorded from previous studies from other specialties. So actually, we started from a higher level. And given that the attitudes need long time to build, that's what we see here, that they are building over time when they are getting the experience to uh, interact in the community. We need to assess that on the long duration while reinforcing this kind of education. For the readiness for interprofessional learning, uh, we got actually improvement, although it was insignificant, but it was uh, an improvement immediately after participation. And this was the time that we would have like brainstorming and interaction together was preparing for the fabric simulation, was discussing the fabric simulation and inside the situation. But actually, although we emphasize the uh, community action within the six weeks, these were individually for each of the three specialities because of conflicting issues with the scheduling between them and which will speak that we need more opportunities for the students to keep the level at increasing level. Looking at the differences by specialty, I know that it's very busy. Uh, like tables, but we got that dental students have lower levels. Let's pick random numbers here. We can see that dental students always have lower level than allied health care specialities, which was actually alarming a little bit to us, why especially dental students having that. When we try to grab it, it's clear here that the yellow like lines or the yellow bars have lower levels than allied healthcare students. And actually these levels were statistically significant for the understanding of poverty and the confidence level. This is something that we need to explore and look at what dental students think and what we provide opportunities for them to enhance their level as related to other specialties. Another thing that we are interested in is the uh, perception of the usefulness. How do students see this approach? Do they see it as an um, important, useful thing for them, for their careers in the future? And actually, we had that more than 75% uh, of the students reported that this approach, they see it as useful to them in some way or another. 57% reported it's very useful and 27% reported that it's somehow useful for us. So we need that to keep up with that. Qualitatively, we got some of the students' codes about it. So here we can like um, see one of the students reported, the poverty simulation gave me a deeper understanding of how difficult life can be when you are not just financially, but time constrained. So here is the access to care. It's money, it's time, it's physical uh, availability. It's, it's a lot of things, it's not like financial. Another student here, like I'm highlighting the thing that um, attracted me more. It's easy as healthcare professionals to judge. It was great for us and the success for us to allow the students to realize that, realize that there is a tendency to judge, but stop, think, and look what they are coming from. Don't assume for them. Yes, and this was the next quote. You should never assume of anything when you are treating patients. You should be understanding of poverty and the how and why some people come to us when they are in too much pain and why they never had come earlier. So don't blame them. Just understand from what they came and try to be competent culturally and competent while you are talking to them and dealing with them. And here, as future healthcare providers, we often view situations from a different angle from those who are the lower class. It's good to acknowledge that. I definitely gained from this experience a better insight into how those in poverty live. This comment was the interprofessional communication that they had the opportunity to do. So the high stress scenario really fostered communication and strategic planning to achieve a common goal. And this is the reality. We need this sort of communication between different specialities that will be reflected on the patient's outcome in the end. And here, another best part about the simulation was that the multidisciplinary uh, approach by collaborating at this early stage in our academic career will be more able to improve communication once we are treating patients. And this is the call. So in conclusion, we our research efforts 
provide and introduce and present an innovative interprofessional experiential learning model that helps to develop deeper level of understanding of one of the main aspects of the social determinants of health. It also has a theoretical foundation to enhance the level of self-efficacy and confidence while providing health care to those low-income groups. We need to incorporate such social determinants of health-based learning model. It's a crucial because the students acknowledge misconceptions could be there. It's great to hear from them. We need to address those early in their career in order to get in the future more positive mindsets among uh, healthcare providers towards those diverse populations. There is also a need to look more into the interprofessional based learning opportunities. We remember this drop. We need to focus more in providing interprofessional opportunities for the students to foster communication and uh, to foster some sort of collaboration and productive uh, cooperation between different healthcare fields. This will enhance the students' attitudes towards interprofessional education, more productive future intercollaboration, and uh, ultimately better health outcomes among different population groups. And also, we saw that dental students have lower levels, notable lower levels of different social determinants of health-based uh, outcome measures. And we need then to look to the dental curriculum to code emphasize it, but we need to implement it more. We need to revitalize the dental curricula with more didactic and field social determinants of health-based experiences. We need to have more cultural competency training because we need this cultural competent generation of dentists with more inclusive mindset. Our research activity was at UT Hall San Antonio. And we would like to incorporate it into other institutions with other healthcare specialists. We need, we need to see whether we can generalize it. And it's a great research effort that's needed, actually, in order to have this um, cultural content generation of dentists, in order to have this social determinants of health, deep level of understanding among future healthcare providers. So finally, thank you very much for your kind attention, participation, and being there today. And we will be happy to answer any questions, thoughts, comments, or any ideas that you want to share with us. Thank you very much. So we do have a few questions um, on our Q&A. And please write down any questions or comments on either the Q&A or the chat. And uh, two of them, the first two are in relation to the poverty simulation. Jessica, will you address those? Yes. Oh, no, excuse me, not the poverty simulation. I am, yes. Yes, Jessica's project. Yes, I'll answer the first two questions. So they're asking how the overall, overall story size comparing in each zip code studied. And yeah, there are different, um, the HTP stores varied in size according to the different zip codes. And unfortunately, I did not collect that data to determine, you know, what the total retail space was at each store. Um, but I would have been a way to improve the project and maybe turn it as a percentage of the total retail space. Maybe, uh, I don't know, we could see how the results would change like that. But, but overall, yeah, there were some stores that were pretty small, pretty limited, and there were others that were really big. And yeah, but I don't have the exact numbers for that. Okay, I think I, I'd like to address the one on the poverty simulation, especially now with, with the pandemic and that we are working on Zoom and virtual. The poverty simulation would be very challenging to do virtually, but there is another activity which I will be working with students this uh, coming semester. It's called spent, S-P-E-N-T dot org. You can look at, look at it online. It's an activity that we will be doing virtually in smaller groups, but it, it has the students make decisions about how will they then uh, make decisions about what to pay, what to do, what not to do. And again, uh, imitate life and life situations and life decisions. So that's something that I would recommend. Um, okay. So there is a question on the zip codes and availability of dental products, how the use of the dental products might have attached the 
affected the availability of dental products in stores. The low usage of oral health products might influence the availability in the store. Okay. Yes, I can answer that. So um, yeah, I guess you could make the argument that maybe there's less products available because people have less money to buy them. Um, it could go both ways. But that just tells us, you know, if people don't have money to buy dental products, that means they may not have um, the proper oral hygiene to keep you know, their teeth in good health. And that can also be an indicator that, okay, maybe outreach programs are necessary in those regions if they can't afford it or if they're not following, you know, proper oral hygiene. That means they, they need that extra help that they need so they can get adequate um, oral health overall. Right. So we were asked how supportive was the faculty of this overall topic and research and do they have an appreciative insight of this experience? I believe so. I believe the faculty was uh, at one point, this was the poverty simulation was an activity that was done at a faculty uh, retreat or a faculty meeting so that all faculty were actually participated in this poverty simulation sometime back. And that's why we also feel it's so important for our students to participate in that. And, and I think, as well as um, their willingness to volunteer to be one of the agencies also shows their support. So we definitely had that and we have support throughout the dental school for that. And if anyone can answer, how does this correlate with food deserts? Did you, do you see a, a parallel there, Jessica? Um, yes, well, I didn't really analyze the, the food deserts in each region, but um, overall, I can't comment on this, that um, in different zip codes, they did sell different types of food in those regions. Unfortunately, those regions with the lower income levels, it was more like junk food available, less, um, you know, organic food available, and that can come into play with the health of that population as well, compared to the more affluent um, neighborhoods. Thank you. So also, you know, the, the point was brought out that maybe now we can survey because there, there are thoughts, this was the first survey or the first project, let's say, when we were looking at dental products and their availability, but we've got visions of continuing and expanding that. And one thought was, would it not be a good idea to now survey the low income people to determine if, they're, if they purchase the products toothbrushes and toothpaste and if they're expensive and you know what would be the difference if they were allowed with SNAP and these are all very good questions that we can definitely look into further. Um, are there other schools who are interested in doing this type of research? I know that there's other there's we have quite a few participants in this session from other schools and it, it would be wonderful to hear from them. And um, right, you know, the comments of like, sometimes you can ask for a grocery store. Somebody did ask us at one point during this presentation at a different time is, have we talked to the grocery store chain and presented this data to them to talk to them? And that definitely is something that we would like to do and consider so that they can know, because sometimes people will ask as one of our comments was in our, in our Q and A is somebody is, has asked their local grocery store, their local chain for a product. And they were asked, well, or they were, the response was that it's not in demand. And so they don't ha have it in their store. But these are things that we can definitely, I think with sharing this information might give some insight to, to the chain. Um, could you share the indicators of the attitudes towards poverty? How would you disrupt or change attitudes? What type of attitudes to poverty? Is that um, yeah, I can answer this one. So the attitudes towards poverty was a validated survey instrument that targeted like specific aspects. They were talking about the stigma towards uh, low income individuals and they were uh, talking about the personal deficiency of the person in relation to this, uh, th those living in poverty. And uh, there was also like uh, 
uh, regarding whether um, the personal pers or the structural perspectives uh, towards uh, those living of poverty, whether it's their fault or the fault of the community or it's a mutual responsibility. So they were uh, the attitude to towards poverty was 21 item that was um, measuring the, the participants' responses on those three aspects. And students would uh, like rate their level of how, how much they agree or disagree with the statements that were um, there, charting those three main aspects on a Likert scale from uh, one to five, like strongly disagree, disagree, like this thing. And we get the, like, the overall score of the attitudes toward poverty. The attitudes toward poverty it's uh, this, we use the short form, the long one was about four, uh, seven questions, which are, are validated the instruments, but we start, we decided to use the short form of the attitudes toward poverty, just to make it easier for the students and uh, to take it. And it's like representative of how they look uh, to those people in four situations. Okay, thank you, Dr. Alwazir. I've also posted on the uh, chat, the virtual activity that we will be using instead of poverty simulation this year that's called spent so that everybody can have that and we did have a response as well that OU College of Dentistry would definitely be interested in doing, doing this type of research. Do we have any additional questions or anybody want to um, ask anything? Mona, I saw Alice Horwitz had her hand raised. Would you like me to unmute her? Yes, of course. She may you. have. Okay. Hi there. Hi. So I, 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 hi. Thank you very much for this wonderful session. I, I did write questions in. I don't know what I did wrong because they may not have shown up. But the one question I have on the dental products, and it has to do with whether or not low-income people who live in that area and this has been partially addressed but it seems to me like it would really be a good idea to survey the people in those zip codes to find out do they purchase these and and do they um can they afford it uh toothbrushes and toothpaste are very expensive as you know and the need for toothbrushes and toothpaste especially now probably compete with whether or not they can even feed their family. Um, the other comment I had on the uh, poverty simulation, which I think is really uh, an exciting innovation, is that it concerns me that so we can get dental students um, accustomed to and maybe better able to work with people who are poor, but when they get in practice, are they going to accept them into their practice if the Medicaid rates are not high enough to at least cover costs? Um, they may volunteer for the local mom, you know, Mission of Mercy, but I think this is another area that we really have to work on. We must get the, the Medicaid rates up so they are competitive. And so students who then are practitioners can basically afford to take these patients on. Thank you. Yes, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Those are very good observations that, you know, it's something that it, it does take many of us in different aspects, uh, whether it be academia, research, policy, to make an impact and to make this difference. And we feel that instilling this to students at an early age, hopefully, maybe they can even become the advocates in the future as well. Does anyone else want to address Dr. Horowitz's comments? I'd agree on, um, on that. I believe embracing this culture of uh, social determinants of health-based education early in their career life would but then hopefully provide like strong advocates, strong champions who can help to transfer the future and draw a new future for the, those low income population. And as we know, like the excess of care have many aspects. So I know that maybe the reimbursement is a very big thing, but 
whenever you have those individuals, it's good to have this culture as well. So we need to address the access to care from the outside, like the, to, to improve the reimbursement rate. And so whenever you have this, those kinds of patients, also like having this understanding, having this high level of uh, empathy and good attitudes toward them will also help. And hopefully we can have like those advocates. All right, I think that we appreciate everyone's comments and questions. Our time is up, but you can certainly reach us. The information of our presentation is in the Texas Oral Health Coalition website. Uh, our emails are on there. We're happy to continue this conversation. We're looking at how we can improve and further these projects and, and maybe expand from them. So your thoughts are always appreciated. And I'm going to um, pass it on over to, to um, Beth. Well, thank you, Magna. Thank you, Dr. El Wazir, uh, Jessica, and Magna for these marvelous presentations. Very informative, very insightful. Um, I think a lot of people got a lot of it, and uh, I recommend that poverty simulation as well. It's uh, it's it's kind of fun actually to to see where you wind up. Uh, the recorded presentations will be available on our website on there, but it will be available for your viewing uh, for edification only. You must attend the live webinar to get continuing dental education credit. But if you just want to see their slides and hear the presentation again, you can certainly view um, the recorded version from our website. So we thank you all again. Thank you all attendees for uh, joining us today. And thank you again, presenters. Have a wonderful, happy and healthy holiday. And um, we wish you all well. Thank you again. Bye-bye.